And it's Ken Kreitzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio. Uh, we're part of Post 135 in White Plains, New York. And today we have a special guest to talk to, and that is Major General John Evans, who is a commanding general, U.S. Army Cadet Command, and also Fort Knox, Kentucky, the major U.S. Army base there. General, good to talk with you today. How are you doing? Ken, doing great. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend a little time with you and your listeners today. No, that's great. I, I know we, I, we always get, want to spend time and enjoy hearing about ROTC programs, which is one of your areas. But uh, one of the things I'd like to start with is that you've got a very interesting background in that uh, you're a graduate of Appalachian State, a uh, very good football program there, by the way. And yeah, then uh, you've got master. Yeah, you've got master's degrees, uh, one from Kansas State and uh, uh, also uh, from the U.S. Navy War College, and you've studied at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. Tell us a little bit about the flow of, of the education that, is, that has supported your career in the U.S. Army. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think the Army is really a model for, uh, for professions, for industry, uh, in taking time to educate our population throughout the life cycle of the career, beginning with the basic officer leadership course that we send all our lieutenants to, to kind of ground them in the skill sets of their basic branch. And then we send them to a captain's career course for about four to five months. So they kind of get the next level of leadership. And then we'll spend that concentrated year for those that we select to do so in residence at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where they really work on being part of a general officer staff and working on the tactical to operational uh, transition in our army. And then a select few get to attend the uh, Senior Service College, uh, the Army War College, or one of the other service war colleges like I did, where we really finish the student, so to speak, the professional, by talking about national strategic level issues. And I've been blessed to be able to do all of those things. And along the way, was able to get a master's in education at Kansas State. And then I actually had an opportunity to spend a year at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, after my uh, war college experience. So I've really been fortunate to make education a part of my foundation throughout my career. Absolutely, and uh, you are a major general. Uh, your second uh, position as a commanding general, uh, leading uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, a major U.S. military installation, and then also the U.S. Army Cadet Command. Why don't you start, tell us, if you would, uh, a little bit about Fort Knox, Kentucky. Everyone knows it's the uh, the center where uh, where the nation's reserves and gold are stored. But tell us a little bit about uh, about the base and its and its uh, sense of history. Yeah. So so interestingly, uh, the the gold uh, bullion depository sits outside our gate. I have a responsibility to protect it externally, but the uh, the Treasury Department actually does all the external protection for that. So we really we like to look at it outside the gate, but we don't have a lot of responsibility for it. You know, Fort Knox has a rich history in our army. Uh, we, we celebrated our 100th anniversary in 2018. So the post was established in 1918. It was originally the home of army artillery. Uh, and frankly, it's named after um, General uh, Henry Knox, who was the chief of continental artillery. And then after uh, World War I, we really saw a transition uh, as the army started to get rid of horse cavalry and go to a mechanized force. It became the home of armor and cavalry and for almost 80 years was the home of armor and cavalry and such luminaries as George Patton uh, and so many others came through here as part of their formative experience. We actually took the armor center and moved it to Fort Benning about 10 years ago uh, and that was an emotional event for the folks around here. We love our tanks and our, our uh, cavalry here uh, but as we did that we thought it was best to co-locate those assets with the infantry center and we made that the Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning. So now we've got tankers and infantrymen training together like they should. Uh, since that time, what we've done is we've really kind of made Fort Knox what we call the Army's Accession and Talent Management Enterprise uh, platform. We brought Cadet Command here from Fort Monroe. We brought United States Army Recruiting Command here. We brought Human Resources Command here from Washington, D.C. Uh, and in addition to that, we've got other commands here like the First Theater Sustainment Command, uh, it moved up from Fort Bragg several years ago. Uh, we've got um, our uh, mission partners that are part of um, our reserve component here with the 84th Training Command, the 100th Training Division, and the headquarters for U.S. Army Reserve Aviation is here. In addition to that, we've got 1st Army Division East, which is charged with readying our Component 2 and Component 3 forces 
for integration with the active component during times of war. And then most recently and proudly, we were able to welcome back Fifth Corps to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, and they've got a, uh, a mission to focus on the European theater. So it's really an amalgamation of lots of different elements from different parts of our Army. So a lot of things going on and uh, key responsibilities at Fort Knox. My, my dad was a, a field artillery officer in World War II, uh, commissioned in 1942. Uh, so good to hear that about the history and field artillery. Now, uh, one of the areas that, uh, that uh, you uh, uh, command is the U.S. Army Cadet Command. And uh, as you may know, we, we spent a lot of time at West Point. They were very pri privileged to follow the careers of the, of the cadets and, and also the athletic teams there. But we also have a history in supporting ROTC programs, uh, uh, Providence College in particular since 9-11, uh, since working with uh, uh, Gary Fortunato, who just sadly passed away last year. But we really enjoy uh, supporting uh, ROTC programs. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about, about uh, ROTC today. Well, first, let me just say we were we were greatly saddened by Sergeant Major Fortunato's passing. He's been a, a foundational figure here at uh, Cadet Summer Training at Fort Knox. And, uh, you know, to, to Gary's family, we wish nothing but the best. And, and we think he left us far too early. Uh, but with regards to what we're doing at Cadet, Summer, uh, Cadet Command here, a lot of folks don't realize that uh, United States Army ROTC is the largest commissioning source in the Army. In fact, on an annual basis, we will commission more lieutenants than West Point, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, Air Force ROTC and Navy ROTC combined. Uh, we account for about 65% of the Army's officer force with regards to where they get their commission. Uh, and that's even on the active duty side. Even though reserve is part of our title, uh, we actually uh, commission about 65% of the Army's active officer force. Uh, we're spread across uh, about uh, 274 different locations across the nation where we've got professors of military science and ROTC programs anchored, and they service almost a thousand colleges and universities because we have kids that will travel from satellite schools to a host institution and receive their training there. And we've got about 32,000 cadets uh, enrolled at any one time, and we will commission somewhere between 5,500 and 6,000 of those cadets each year. So a pretty significant enterprise that spreads across the nation. Absolutely. Now, maybe you could uh, describe how ROTC uh, programs uh, work to train officers. It's a little bit different than West Point, West Point which is kind of a 24-7, 47-month experience. But uh, I've been very impressed with the leadership training that we've seen in, uh, in various ROTC programs that we've had a chance to visit. Yeah, so it's interesting. When I talked to the superintendent at West Point, we agree on the fact that, that uh, our cadets are basically from the same stock, right? They come from families across America, some of which are legacy military families, some of which are first-time military families. They bring a great deal of diversity uh, to both ROTC and West Point. I think where the difference occurs is that at West Point, the minute you get there on our day, uh, they are teaching you to conform to the West Point model. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's, that's a tried and true, time-honored tradition that they get to do and they mold you based on that model. And there's not a lot of deviance from that model. The nice thing about ROTC is with the exception of my six senior military colleges and my four military junior colleges, which are very much like West Point, all of our kids are college kids. They're college kids and then about twice a week, they'll put on the uniform and they'll go out to class and learn about military science. And then they'll go out and do a military science laboratory and, turn, and learn about the, the hands-on practical skills that are required to be an army officer. So when they come into the army, our West Pointers still bring that rich diversity where they're from, but a lot of that has kind of been uh, formatted out of them by virtue of their four years at West Point. Our ROTC cadets still bring that rich diversity and background from being you know, a college kid on a college campus who's also doing ROTC, and now they bring that into the force. And so it's a nice blend, I think, for our commissioning force of uh, different experiences that makes us a, a very good total army. And maybe for listeners that uh, may not be uh, familiar with the format of, an R of a typical ROTC program uh, uh, and how to apply and what are the qualifications uh, for them, maybe you could uh, summarize those uh, 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 for the audience. Sure. So we've got a couple of different paths into Army ROTC. Uh, the one that people are most familiar with is very much like the West Point uh, uh, application process. That is, we have four-year national scholarships 
and three-year advanced designee office offer scholarships that call, that uh, high school seniors can apply for. They simply go to GoArmy.com, select uh, Army Officer, and that'll pull down a scroll down menu and it'll walk them through the application process if they would like to apply for a four-year or three-year advanced designee scholarship. We also have the ability to have people just enroll in Army ROTC class, either as a freshman, a sophomore, uh, and then they can take the class and if they like it, they can continue. We'll put them on contract uh, at the beginning of their junior year and they can continue on through the Army uh, and they would not necessarily be on scholarship. We also have scholarships that we allow our brigades to distribute to those cadets who've shown an aptitude in the program that maybe did not receive a national scholarship. Uh, and they again, they can uh, start this process as freshmen in college and do all four years of progression as a military science student and, and ROTC cadet, or they can actually begin in their junior year. In order to do that, they have to go to our basic camp uh, in the summer between their sophomore and junior year to kind of get all of the instruction that they would have received in those first two years, and they can kick off their junior year on contract and spend two years training to be an Army officer. Very good. Now, uh, one of the things I notice in, in ROTC programs is that there are some specialty areas that uh, that uh, graduates can go to that you actually can't from West Point, such as uh, nursing. And we know, and we know the Army produces a, a tremendous number of, of our country's uh, medical professionals in both doc doctors, nurses, technicians. And uh, tell us perhaps about some of the specialty areas that uh, that uh, that a graduate of your of the Army ROTC program might be able might be eligible for. Yeah, so so like uh, West Point, we have a number of fellowships that we work through with industry that allow us to to uh, provide additional training for our cadets during the summer uh, course time frame. We are the only commissioning source that uh, commissions nurses. Now, nurses can also laterally enter the Army through a direct commissioning source, but West Point doesn't do nurses and OCS doesn't do nurses. So ROTC is the only of the three big commissioning sources that, that actually trains nurses for our Army. We have the opportunity, just like West Point, to put people on educational delay to go to law school uh, or to go to medical school. Uh, so we've got a lot of the same opportunities that you'll find uh, at West Point. Very good. And and one of the uh, big programs that I've heard so much about is the summer training that uh, all the cadets go to uh, uh, between their junior and senior year uh, where they, they they learn and they're also assessed uh, for uh, their placement in the, in the U.S. Army. T tell us a little bit about that uh, program. Sure. So we're actually in the midst of that right now. It's the 1st of July as we record this. Uh, and I will tell you that um, we have got about uh, 9,000 people on mission right now at Fort Knox supporting cadet summer training. We've got uh, seven regiments of advanced camp going on right now, two regiments of basic camp going on. We will eventually train 11 regiments of advanced camp and three regiments of basic camp. And what we'll do is over the course of 100 days, we'll bring 10,000 cadets to Fort Knox and train them. So it's the largest annual training event in the Army. And for our advanced camp cadets that come to Fort Knox in the summer between their junior and senior year, this is their finishing exercise, so to speak. This is a 35-day total immersion in Army skills to get them ready to be lieutenants. And they'll spend their, their senior year in ROTC as the leadership cadre for the rest of the cadets and also learning about ethics and, and the profession of arms so that when they graduate, they can go to their basic officer leader courses uh, and then on to their first units of assignment. Very good. And, and we've watched, uh, uh, has there been uh, several programs where ROTC cadets and West Point cadets come together, the Sanders competition in April being one of those, an extraordinary event uh, uh, each year, but then also getting the cadets ready for both uh, uh, officer sourcing areas to be ready to work together in the U.S. Army as soon as they graduate, go out to the Army, go to the basic training, uh, uh, courses, uh, the officer courses, other programs, ranger school and the like. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, you prepare the ROTC graduates to work out in the uh, in the Army. So, you know, it's a great uh, point you make about working with West Point cadets before they all come together as lieutenants. We've not done as much of that. We didn't do any last year, frankly, because of COVID. We're not doing as much this year because we're being cautious, we're being cautious with COVID. But historically, what we've done is we've sent ROTC cadets to West Point for some of their summer training. We've invited West Point cadets down to uh, cadet summer training at, at Fort Knox to go through advanced camp with some of our cadets. 
they will see each other at uh, what we call cadet advanced individual training opportunities like airborne school, air assault school, northern warfare school, those types of things. And then you've got a mix of Army ROTC cadets and West Point cadets that take part in what we call our cadet troop leader training program, CTLT, which occurs across our Army in all of our operational units where we will invite cadets in for about a three to four week period to the 82nd or the 101st or 1st Infantry Division. And that cadet will have an opportunity to serve as a platoon leader in a real Army unit and kind of get a feel for about a month or so of what it's like to, to actually lead in that type of organization. Obviously, they're properly supervised and mentored during that time, but it's a real great opportunity to learn what the real Army is doing. And that, that opportunity is available, like I said, for both West Point cadets and Army ROTC cadets. And we're, we're just real advocates for the ROTC programs. We've had a chance to visit several, one of which uh, Morgan State, uh, we actually honor to graduates of their programs from uh, from the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, uh, uh, two extraordinary officers. And uh, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the uh, graduates of ROTC programs. Some take leadership positions in the Army. Others may w work, uh, move off to business careers and, and provide leadership there. Just tell us a little bit about how the ROTC program adds to uh, their leadership potentially than the military business or even uh, civic leadership? Well, I, I think as I talk to industry leaders, as I talk to civic leaders and, and uh, leaders of our local government and, and uh, frankly, our national government, they talk about their ROTC uh, experience as being formative as they became young leaders. I mean, if you take a look at it, I tell people all the time, the Army is the, is the PhD institution of choice for leadership. I mean, there's nobody that does it better. If you want to go to Harvard or somewhere else and, and get a document that says, I have a PhD in leadership organization, that's fine. But the Army gives one to you the minute you pin on a bar. So uh, I, I think what you'll find is of our uh, cohort of officers that we commission each year for the Army, we only need to keep about half of them by the time they're majors. Many of them will attrit of their own volition. They'll reach their, uh, their active duty service obligation window and they'll say, thank you for the four or five years I've spent. I'm going to go off and do something else with my life. And we're thankful for their service. And then they carry our values with them and are great ambassadors of the Army as they move off. Others will attrit other ways. You know, we, obviously, we have injuries. We have people that don't make promotion lists uh, based on performance because, hey, this is not your kid's soccer team, right? We want the absolute best playing in the game every day because the stakes are high. But we only need about half of who we commission. That's part of our model design right now. Uh, and so it, what it does is it helps proliferate this incredible uh, cadre of leadership back out into industry, back out into America, back out into our communities. Uh, and they, they can talk about the virtues of Army ROTC or a West Point experience. Uh, and that is part of what feeds the process that, that supports our all volunteer force. So it's really an, an interesting life cycle that goes on. Absolutely. And uh, we're having a chance to chat with Major General John R. Evans, who is the commanding general of the U.S. Army Cadet Command and also Fort Knox, a uh, major installation for the U.S. Army in Kentucky. And, and General Evans, maybe has there been a highlight of your career of service in the U.S. Army that uh, really stands out for you, a special time? So, uh, so I'm, unfortunately, I'm a little unipolar in, uh, in what I've done in the Army. I'm, I'm a special operations aviator. So I spent about 22 years uh, in support of or assigned to uh, Army Special Operations Aviation, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. I like to tell people when they don't understand what that is, we're the Black Hawk Down guys. Uh, that, that gives everybody a frame of reference. And those were incredibly rewarding years and incredibly rewarding assignments. But I think my wife and I, as we are in our 37th month of command here, uh, have looked at each other and said, there has been no experience that has been more enriching for us or more rewarding than serving right here at Fort Knox for Cadet Command and also for this amazing Fort Knox community. So I'd have to say, sitting here one month away from changing command, that this has been the highlight of my career. Absolutely. Well, we're very fortunate to help support the Special Operations Warrior Foundation based down in Tampa. They are annually up at the New York Yankees Military Appreciation Day, a favorite charity uh, of the Steinbrenner family. And we enjoy uh, featuring and talking uh, to their leadership and, and the cadets and the, and the, and the uh, young adults that they uh, support in that uh, very valuable program. And you mentioned uh, Fort Knox. Uh, 
Fourth of July next week. Uh, is there a special series of activities, family events uh, uh, that you'll have at, at Fort Knox to celebrate uh, Independence Day? Absolutely. We invite everybody from the community to come in and join us. Uh, it's free. Uh, all you have to do is come through our gate, get a visitor pass and join us uh, on the 4th of July, starting at six o'clock. We're gonna do a salute to the nation. We'll have our morale, welfare and recreation folks out there. We'll have a short presentation. We'll have live music bands. And then at about 9.30, once it gets dark enough here in this part of Kentucky, we're gonna do a fireworks display that'll be twice as big this year because we bought all the fireworks last year, but couldn't shoot them off because of COVID. So uh, a really good opportunity to really get everybody back together and break the ice a little bit uh, in our community. If you're fully vaccinated plus uh, 14 days, no requirement to wear a mask. Uh, if you've not had the vaccination or not had that opportunity, uh, then we will ask you to wear a mask while you're out there with the public. But we're excited about our 4th of July celebration and it's gonna be a pretty exciting 245th birthday for our nation on the 4th of July. Absolutely, sounds like a terrific day. And uh, Major General John R. Evans, thank you for uh, your time today chatting with us, Sons of America Legion Radio. Most importantly, thank you for your service to our country and your distinguished career. Ken, it was a real honor. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Our pleasure. And uh, this is Ken Kratzer for Sons of the America Legion Radio. We're based at Post 135 in White Plains, New York. We're proud to represent the 2 million veterans of the American Legion and the 300,000 members of the Sons of the American Legion supporting America's veterans. And I'm in White Plains, New York. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for watching.